it's my pleasure today to present to you Ainsley Morse, who teaches in the Russian department at Dartmouth College and is a translator of Russian and former Yugoslav literatures. Her research focuses on the literature and culture of the post-war Soviet period, particularly unofficial or underground poetry, uh, as well as the avant-garde and children's literature. Um, and her book, uh, Wordplay, Experimental Poetry and Soviet Children's Literature just came out with Northwestern University Press. Um, and I'm going to paste a link to the book into the chat for everyone. Um, and I am going to just pass the floor over to Ainsley and let her um, introduce her title and, and get going. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Sasha. Um, this is very exciting. I suspect that if I had been able to come in person, 83 people would not have come to listen to this talk about the late Soviet underground. So this is, this is possibly the largest group of people I've ever spoken in front of. And I'm in my house. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and get started. Um, I would like to make a shameless plug uh, for thank you very much to, to Maya and Sasha for sharing the link to my book that just came out. I am um, next month, I'm going to give a talk about that book. So if anybody wants to hear more about it, what I will talk about today overlaps only very slightly with what is in the book. So happy to talk about that too. So this talk is called Collecting, Recollecting, Recollecting in the Late Soviet Underground. Um, and I start with a reference to the early Soviet period, uh, the Egyptian stamp by Man Osip Mandelstam. So in the Egyptian stamp, Mandelstam writes, quote, the centrifugal force of time has scattered our Viennese chairs and the Dutch plates with the little blue flowers, end quote. Uh, obviously, the temporal force of the Soviet century scattered more than just typical bourgeois furniture and dishes, uh, literary and artistic traditions, ways of life, and plenty of human lives were blown to pieces as well. Yet in her history of socialist kitsch, Svetlana Boim offers Mandelstam's chairs and plates um, as an illustration of the fact that, quote, in Soviet Russia, the experience of material scarcity for the majority of the population and the official critique of bourgeois commodities endows private objects with a different cultural significance, end quote. Boehm po points to an important link that ties practices of aesthetic commemoration, which preserve and celebrate both brilliant artistic achievements and everyday objects to the aesthetics of survival. Commemoration and survival come together in the practice and more broadly the concept of collecting, which takes on an interesting prominence in the Soviet period. Conceptually speaking, collecting points not only to preservation, but also to the existence or imposition of a system and the search for order. Collecting of words, phrases, habits, and objects suggests a way of both holding on to individual and cultural heritage and also grasping and imposing logical order on bewildering new circumstances, something sorely needed in the post-1917 cultural situation in Russia. Concerns over the loss of unique heritage and local culture highlight the conservative preservationist side of collecting. Meanwhile, collecting is also typical of avant-garde and modernist aesthetics, obsessed with the factual and documentary fundamentally fragmented, full of missing connections, and partial to the arbitrary aesthetics of the list. So the practice of collecting becomes even more noticeable in <clears throat> later Soviet unofficial culture, especially in the neo-avant-garde manifestation of it. To a significant extent, this unofficial culture was fixated on the recovery or preservation and or preservation of artistic practices, especially avant-garde and modernist that were seen as lost or suppressed after the revolution. Writers and artists aggressively collected and often applied innovative techniques and forms that were still proscribed by official aesthetic policy. And remarkable achievements in unofficial scholarship and what was called textology, textologia, attest further to these recovery efforts. At the same time, these writers heightened attention to the past 
resulted in an equally acute awareness of the extraordinary nature of their own time. Collecting um, of present day minutiae in the form of documents, lists, and other semi-arbitrary groupings often appears as a neo-avant-garde device in their work. So finally, the problematic question of collecting versus creating is highly relevant to unofficial art and literature, the originality of which is threatened, often threatened by its fixation on the past. These retrospective and accumulative orientations vis-a-vis -vis the past and the present alike make collecting a typical method and a device of later unofficial literature and art. So I claim that the frequency with which it appears makes this device an, a distinguishing feature of unofficial production. Um, so underground writers experience of marginalization also made them aware of the arbitrary nature of literary canons, which influenced the unconventional nature of their collecting. So here I quote uh, Walter Benjamin's famous essay on the collector Edward Fuchs. Um, Fuchs felt that collecting should strive to recreate a maximally full and balanced portrait of the past. So the quote is, we see the past in its splendid festive gown and rarely encounter it in its most shabby working clothes, end quote. Benjamin admires Fuchs's collecting of mass-produced, anonymous, kitschy, and otherwise low-quality art. Uh, quote, uh, oh, which, quote, meant the ruin of a series of cliches in traditional art history. Fuchs had broken completely with the classicist conception of art. The concepts by means of which the bourgeoisie developed this notion of art no longer play a role in Fuchs's work. Neither the appearance of beauty, nor harmony, nor the unity of the manifold are to be found there." End quote. Benjamin asks whether this shift might implicitly challenge traditional notions of great men and geniuses, which strike him as particularly problematic at the time of his writing in 1937. While many unofficial Soviet writers strove to collect and thus commemorate the traditions of pre-revolutionary high culture, their collecting also demonstrated an awareness of a broader, broader sense of aesthetics than either that of like symbolism or socialist realism, which is classically inflected. So um, as I will mention, as I will demonstrate in a minute, Mendelstam was not the only 1920s writer to be struck by the effects of this centrif centrifugal force of time on objects, people, and culture. And the natural response was to scramble to pick up or collect um, the pieces. Uh, later Soviet collecting diverges from these models in several important ways. It tends to become more grandiose in terms of scale, more deliberately mundane in terms of content, and even more future oriented, even utopian. As Boehm suggests, quote, useless fragmentary and imperfect objects, unquote, offer a way toward a new order that implies a utopian potential, but one that refuses to be serious, that insists on remaining the kitschy dream of an untalented artist. After a brief discussion of early Soviet literary collecting, I will uh, talk a bit about collecting in the work of several late Soviet unofficial writers, um, in particular Vsevolod Nikrasov, uh, Konstantin Kuzminsky, and uh, the prose writer uh, Leon Bogdanov. So um, briefly on, on the early Soviet period, um, I think that it is relevant to this question that the years following the revolution saw a general crisis in traditional genres in literature. Um, <clears throat> so Mandelstam himself wrote about the end of the novel. Um, there was a preponderance of experimental, semi-documentary, explicitly in between genres, um, which often employ collecting as a, as a noticeable device. So work such as Lydia Ginsburg's idiosyncratic notes and diary-based genres and the poetry and prose of Konstantin Vaginov are both typical of their time and remarkably forward thinking with a view to developments, later, later developments. Um, so let's see, how do I move ahead here? Vaginov. Um, in his novels, Vaginov points to collecting as both a pathology and a creative mode typical of intellectuals in the 20s and 30s, as they simultaneously mourned 
uh, the departed pre-revolutionary ways of life and struggled to find their place in a rapidly changing cultural and political environment. Um, Ginsburg's experimentation, we can look at her too, with fragmentary and documentary genre, genres also reflect a wish to, quote, somehow achieve a retrospective glance at life as it is being lived, unquote, to simultaneously experience reality unfolding, to record its traces while leaving open the possibility for a more distanced and literary level of categorization. Wagenhoff uh, both modeled and chronicled the transition of culture from the esoteric experiments of old world academic and literary circles to the sterner, simpler mandates of the new Soviet bit. In his novels, he points up the loss of the pre-revolutionary bourgeois lifestyle through intelligentsia characters, often collectors, marooned somewhere between crushing nostalgia for the past and awkward doomed attempts to adapt to the new Soviet reality through systematization. So if there are any uh, Wagner fans in the audience, um, you will remember that in the, the Wagner's last novel from 1934, it's unfinished, Garpoganiana, there is a, a character called the systematizer, systematizer, the systemizer, um, who is an obsessive collector. So this obsessive categorizing collecting is often in an elegiac vein. The objects, forms, and by extension, ways of life that the characters catalog are irrevo irrevocably departed. Meanwhile, these characters are not always very sympathetic. So the one I mentioned is, is disgusting. Um, at best, they are ineffectual and deluded intellectuals, and at worst, they are grotesque and inhuman, uh, consumed by the desire to own and systematize their inert acquisitions. Um, so collecting is not just a highly metaphorical activity and life occupation for Wagner's characters. It's a central device in his own writing. Um, collecting can be felt in the composition of the novels. Instead of direct attention to the large scale tectonic shifts of political life, he catalogs the many tiny shifts of daily life through microscopic attention to mundane objects, snippets of songs, recipes, and other minutiae. Um, the Wagner scholar Dmitri Bresler shows that um, Wagner's work on the drafts of this final novel demonstrate its own kind of systematizing as he inserts and organizes unaltered and unmotivated fragments of living speech that were collected in his notebook. So Wagner had this, there's a, in the archive, there's a, a notebook that he entitled Seeds, Siemichki. Um, from the early 1930s, and it's just a collection of phrases, statements, words, and you can, they, they migrate directly into the novels. Um, and again, for the Wagner fans in the audience, you might remember a scene in Bambachada, the third novel, where he's just, like, the characters are hanging out in a beer hall, and it, basically it's just a list of, like, random things that people are saying that use language in a funny way. Um, most of the language collected in the notebooks and then reproduced in the novels is, is marginal. It's like prastarichia. <clears throat> so according to Ginsburg, the novelist was meant to understand life, which entailed a systematic description of the facts and an explanation of the connections between them. Importantly for both Ginsburg and Wagner, collecting of facts, turns of phrase, implies a certain distance and objectivity vis-a-vis -vis the material, which in both of their cases was mostly human material, this living speech. Um, and this is characteristic of a lot of writing that we see in the 1920s. This takes us into the idea of um, factographic writing. Um, and Ginsburg uh, dreamed of creating, quote, an unnameable genre closest to a diary in the form of a novel unquote, where she could fix the flow of life without invention or recollection. At this point, invention has become passe and implies a kind of willful ignorance of um, or resistance to the, the new lifestyle of the Soviet experiment. So um, in the novel I just mentioned, Wagner's Bambachada from 1931, there is a society for the collecting of trifles um, 
uh, what is it, Общество для коллекционирования мелоч мелочей, which explicitly includes language among its collectible items. Um, in addition to soap and candy wrappers, uh, the society's members are interested in the texts of store signs, which reflect the nuances of different political affiliations in the NAP period. This dimension of collecting raises the question of the communication value of all of this verbiage. Through his character's variously farcical collections and in his own poetry, Vaginov points to the impossibility of communication, the lack of a shared common language and the inability of language to be anything other than a meaningless decoration, if, even if it's sometimes beautiful. The traces of the recent past, however carefully cataloged, thus become increasingly unparsable and incoherent, as do the people who cling to them. These concerns prove to be hardly unique to the early Soviet or modernist moment and constitute a far-seeing diagnosis on Vaginov's part. So uh, moving into the later Soviet period, we find really countless examples of literary collecting. Um, collecting as a device emerges as, a, as, a, as a, also a common feature for visual and conceptual artists at this time. And I'll name Ilya Kabakov as just one of the most obvious examples. Um, also uh, typical of some of the conceptualist writers of the time, so in Kabakov's milieu, um, you see this aesthetic of collecting, which falls in line with the what, what Benjamin described in Fuchs, collecting mass-produced and kitschy material. Um, conceptualism, likewise, tends to foreground the absence or irrelevance of artistic skill. So my examples are not going to come from conceptualist proper. Um, I am interested in collecting as a literary device, but also some of the broader implications. Sievolod Nikrasov was an early precursor to the conceptualist, and he painstakingly collected words and phrases, mostly of his present moment. Um, he considered these lists raw material from which poetry would naturally emerge. Kuzminsky, an inveterate collector, amassed tremendous amounts of poetry, prose and art produced by his contemporaries in Leningrad and even all over the world later, um, organizing it into many different kinds of collections. And Leon Bogdanov compiled his notes or memos Zamietki uh, by obsessively tracking the ephemera of his everyday life and news stories uh, about natural disasters around the globe. So Nikrasov, here is Nikrasov, was known as a minimalist, which seems to point in the opposite direction of obsessive collecting. But even minimalism can participate in the collecting mindset. So this is one example. Um, I can read the I can read the Russian. Chulki naski galstuki tkani knigi agni obu fadjezda mi mebil nadjezda lyubov. The list format immediately provokes the reader to seek potential groupings of otherwise rather random material. The first items are obviously material goods, clothing. They then shade increasingly in the direction of less material with the books lights or fires, um, but then back again, shoes, clothes, furniture, at which point rhyme makes a rather amusing appearance uh, with this kind of surprising hope and love, rhyming with shoes and clothes. Um, so even as, especially there, even as this is overtly tongue in cheek, the poem nevertheless draws attention to the blurred lines between the accumulation of material objects versus ephemeral lofty concepts that you might find um, on the part of a collector, or uh, I think there's also a pointing toward a Soviet hoarder of scarce goods, right? Um, <clears throat> so many of Nikrasov's poems are this short, if not shorter, and composed of even fewer words. But many of them have their origin in a sort of storehouse composed of hundreds of words and phrases that he painstakingly collected and processed over decades. Quote, this was why I had to carefully work my way 
by hearing, by feel, through repetition and selection, through something like several tens of thousands of words, unquote. Um, so he's talking about this project, which he sometimes called my, I call it my lexicon, he called it Moy Slavar, um, which entailed selecting, testing, and then activating certain words, sometimes in phrases or rhyming pairs. These words become raw material, he calls it zagatovki, and might find their way into actual poems. Um, as he wrote in an early preface to one of these collections, quote, my lexicon, a dictionary of words that I've amassed, which I use myself or could use, not exactly an active vocabulary, but not passive either. Let's say potential vocabulary. At the very least, these are words whose character I know well enough to be able to suggest this or that context to them. I wanted to find correspondences that were sort of objective, but not intellectual, obvious, but only in hindsight. In fact, many of my poems from the 1960s and 70s are essentially fragments of this series." End quote. The title phrase of this piece, Pravila Isklucenia, is probably best translated as the rules of exclusion, um, which is a typically Nikrasovian pun, right? It's both the rule and the exception, but also a reference to his rage toward the cliquish behavior of late and post-Soviet literary communities. And finally, a crucial guide to any serious collector. What are the criteria for what is included in the collection and what is left out? Nikrasev's essay is followed by a poem that covers 10 pages in Microsoft Word and contains 991 words. It is identified as an excerpt from the full text of this lexicon, um, which was compiled uh, or composed over a period of 25 years. It would seem that this collecting encouraged Nikrasev to experiment with much longer forms. His second longest poem, which begins Vabshe Kanyeshna, it doesn't have a title other than that, uh, clocks in at 700 words and as, uh, has a similar constructive principle, but fewer repetitions than, than what we see in the Pravila Isklucenia. Composed of interlocking, often punning phrases, the poem presents another exhaustive example of how this private word collection works as both a repository and a breeding ground for poetry. On the one hand, Nikrasov's collecting project seems firmly rooted in the present moment. The words he seeks out and tests for validity are first and foremost his words, the ones that he himself uses or might use. Still, the project has a distinctly commemorative element as well. Um, so he stated many times that his work as a poet is to dig out the words and phrases left alive after the catastrophic violence done to language um, by Soviet usage. So this extends to taking words whose meaning has been gutted and trying to make them capable of meaning again, which might be sort of part of what's going on with Nadezhda and Yubov in the poem that I read. Um, so uh, Nikrasov's ostensible vein, uh, aim, moreover, is communication. He's testing all these words out for their capacity to mean meaningfully and function in discourse. However, Nikrasov's word collecting certainly begs a some kind of parallel with Vaginov's Siemichki collection, which recorded curious and expressive examples of real life speech. So this, this phrase, uh, is used by Vaginov back then. It's very important for Nikrasov in his, in his writing about poetry. Um, on the one hand, Nikrasov's word collecting works toward this positive aim of recuperating lots of everyday words and reactivating them as potential material for poetry. On the other hand, there are problematic aspects to the notion of collecting bits of um, living speech. Uh, as Benjamin pointed out, quote, what is decisive in collecting is that the object is detached from all its original functions in order to enter into the closest conceivable relation to things of the same kind, end quote. The collector necessarily seeks to control and order that which he collects, upsetting the natural order of original function. And this sometimes seems to reveal on Nikrasov's part, a paradoxical desire to limit and constrain speech. 
As the poet and critic Alexander Ulanov suggests, quote, in his push for truth at any price, Nikrasov consciously limited the possibilities of language such that regardless the individual's will, it would be simply impossible to utter an untruth, end quote. Um, Nikrasov's word accumulating can also shade into the fetishistic. By making words his own, he endows them with a kind of hermetic Nikrasov specific meaning that goes against his stated aim of writing formally unusual, but in its own way, traditional lyric poetry. Um, so moving on to Kuzminsky. <clears throat> Konstantin Kuzminsky was a prominent figure in Leningrad's uh, unofficial literature and art scene in the 60s and 70s. Um, his, his collecting project began at home in Leningrad uh, with the Zhivoya Zierkala collection. So at the far left of this slide, um, this was a project that Kuzminsky started in 1967 with Suzanne Massey, um, was an interesting lady. Uh, she was in Leningrad because she was married at the time to Robert Massey, who's like a writer of popular books about the Romanovs. And they just, they met Kuzminski because he was a tour guide at Pavlovsk or Pushkin or something. Um, and they made this book together. The, the, the English language cover that you see, the book came out in the US in 1972. Um, uh, uh, but they started it in 1967. Um, each subsequent collection that Kuzminski worked on um, featured more and more material. Um, oh, I did want to point out, of course, that as some of you might recognize from the cover, the Living Mirror book, it has five poets, um, three official Soviet poets, uh, Alexander Kushner, Gleb Garbovsky, Viktor Sasnora, uh, as well as Brodsky, Joseph Brodsky, and Konstantin Kuzminsky. Uh, definitely a high point in, in his fame. Um, so subsequently, Kuzminsky compiled another version of Zhivoye Zierkala. That's the second thing on the slide. This is Vtaroy Etap. This one has 14 poets. Um, then he participated in the attempt, oops, sorry, in the attempt to do the Liapta anthology in 1975, which was supposed to have 32 poets. Um, but the grandiose extent of his vision was only truly realized after he emigrated to the United States in 1976. There he moved from fantasizing about compiling a collection of 100 poets of Leningrad to actually compiling the enormous nine volume Blue Lagoon anthology. Um, this anthology took six years to publish and ultimately featured work by several hundred poets and artists, um, both of unofficial Soviet and diaspora provenance. The fact that Kuzminsky brought this project to fruition only in emigration has both practical and symbolic significance. A publication on this scale and featuring such heterogeneous material would have been nearly impossible to mount in Samizdat. And the luxurious material potential of Tamizdat had already been demonstrated by this other collection that came out in 1977, Apollon Simsitsiem, which was um, done by Edward Limonov and Mikhail Shimyakin in Paris. And Kuzminsky participated in at the far right of the slide, this is like about half of the Sadrzhania. So you can see that it's also quite grandiose in its scale um, back in 77. Um, more symbolically, we can point to a frequent metaphor associated with both the collector and the unofficial poet, uh, that of internal emigration, right? So there's the famous Brodsky anecdote from Davlatov about this. Um, Kuzminski had certainly spent years in internal emigration while he was in Leningrad, but his collecting kicked into higher gear when he found himself in actual emigration in the US. Um, uh, the, I think that the, the, the point for me here is the idea that the collector needs a certain distance from the object slash subject of his, of his collecting. Um, so Kuzminski is collecting combines elements of the nostalgic collecting of exile, 
and the more circumspect self-deprecating collecting of academia. Um, so Ginsburg and Wagenhoff and many of Wagenhoff's fictional characters are, are writers and literature scholars, right? This is part of what motivates their collecting, um, even if they were very obviously marginalized by their times. Kuzminski makes this marginalization, marginality work for him um, by creating a whole world of interlocking collections and an entire quasi-academic canon of his own creation. Um, and this is funny because he has a famous quip about how all professors should be hanged. Um, so his, his playing with, with um, a kind of academic approach is always entertaining to look at. Um, so Benjamin, again, in his description of Edouard Fuchs writes, quote, from the very beginning, he was not meant to be a scholar, nor did he ever become a scholarly type, despite all the scholarship which he amassed in his later life. His efforts constantly projected beyond the limits which confine the horizon of the researcher, end quote. So in this, in this way, particularly, Kuzminski really resembles this classic collector, someone who is purposefully marginal in relation to so-called normal life, uh, who utterly disregards standard and utilitarian considerations. As Kuzminski himself wrote, quote, I do not divide literature into literature and life. For us, it was all one, end quote. Such a collector creates a kind of perfect world, a utopia, perhaps, through collected objects, or in Kuzminski's case, poets and poems. The many fascinating functions of his individual collecting are most fully expressed in the Blue Lagoon anthology. To begin with, it strives to be a museum-like collection of everything, a faithful replication of a sprawling, once vibrant community that has been lost and scattered. Kuzminski claimed that his criteria for collecting have been maximally broad. Quote, I'm printing it because I found it. We'll sort it all out later on, end quote. Writing in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the critic Vladislav Kulakov responds to this exhortation. He writes, well, it seems that now the time has come to sort things out. Kuzminski felt more acutely than many of his literary coevals, who were often a lot more successful, the inevitability and necessity of this sorting out to come. This is what he was working toward. The existing models for the history of post-1950 Russian poetry, Soviet and emigre alike, didn't work for Kuzminsky. They were all insufficiently complete. For Kuzminsky, the primary principle was no one and nothing is forgotten, end quote. At the same time, Kuzminsky's anthology is a highly partisan, non-objective, quasi-scholarly attempt to construct an alternative canon of Russian literature, Kuzminsky's canon. He makes no secret of his total non-objectivity, freely distributing praise and insults to the authors he publishes, and sometimes arranging them into completely idiosyncratic groupings. Uh, still, as Ilya Kukui writes, the anthology is more than just a catalog of Kuzminski's collecting. For him, collecting is a tool of the Kulturträger, not just an end in and of itself. Uh, Kuzminski's collection has a vision of its own significance that transcends mere lists and catalogs. Finally, collecting for Kuzminski also emerges as a literary device. His anthology can be read as a gargantuan piece of bad graphomaniacal writing, a novel featuring Kuzminski as the protagonist. As Daniela Davidov writes in a review of the first Russian publication of, the, of um, volume one of the anthology, quote, this book is most definitely a megaphone for Konstantin Kuzminsky, his soapbox, his book of memoirs, his long list of modern Russian poetry, a portrait of his proclivities, a portrait of a generation as seen by this compiler. In short, this publication is something inseparable from the figure of Kuzminsky himself, a sort of autonomous extension of his body. The anthology has long since turned into an autobiography, as Kuzminsky himself put it, end quote. So this antho the anthology project grew from one to nine volumes over the course of its publication. And when the paper ran out, it continued nearly without stopping on the internet. In another parallel with Fuchs, whom Benjamin calls a ramasseur or pack rat, Kuzminski too can be said to have taken a Rebellasian delight in quantities, 
His collecting thus takes part in the self-sufficient nature of collecting, the way it becomes an end in and of itself and can sprawl into an all-consuming obsession, something impossible to end. So the final example I want to draw your attention to today is Leon Bogdanov. Um, he was a, uh, a Leningrad-based prose writer and visual artist active in Lenin, uh, active between the 1960s and 80s. And I'll just mention in passing that a lot of what we know about him comes from Kuzminsky's anthology. So like the picture on the right is taken directly from there. Um, <clears throat> Bogdanov had a legendary reputation as a hermit devoted to obsessively collecting things, both ephemeral, um, so news items, uh, particularly about natural and political disasters, and material, um, so uh, uh, in his case, it was tea. He, he, he collected a lot of tea. That's why there's tea on the slide. Um, <clears throat> Both of these areas of focus are reflected in the title of his epic work, which is called Notes on Tea Drinking and Earthquakes, uh, um, which was a gigantic undertaking over 400 pages long that combines elements of lyrical diary, meditative reflection, and sound bites reproduced verbatim from newspapers. Um, the only reason that this work ended was because he died in 1987. Um, so it might it might have gone on. He started he started the, the book in 1980. Um, so uh, they he did win the Andre Bieli Prize in 1985 for the amount of it that had been completed at that time, which was circulating in Samizdat, but it, it kept going. So the posthumous edition is longer. Um, the genre of the notes distinctly recalls Ginsburg's dream of producing a diary in the form of a novel. Um, the editors of the full 2002 edition go out of their way to assert the literary nature of the text and its distinction from pure diary. Another reader, the artist Viktor Pivavarov, points out that Bogdanov's notes are, quote, distinguished by their relationship, not typical of a diary, toward the actual object of description that is toward what is being experienced, Life as it is being lived, that which could be perceived as existence has in and of itself absolutely no meaning for the author. It only acquires a certain meaning if it becomes material for literature." End quote. <clears throat> um, these protests, like saying that this is definitely literature, it is not just a diary, uh, are necessary because of the way Bogdanov's text does adhere to certain diary conventions. Dates are noted, though not consistently. Um, and even more so the way it presents as a giant collection of newspaper clippings, shopping receipts, and fleeting observations of everyday life. However, Bogdanov's project diverges from the material-focused collecting that we can see in Kuzminsky or Nikrasov. Although the notes show him following the book market with similar interest as that he follows natural disasters. They also demonstrate his refusal to accumulate things, including books, which contradicts a traditional understanding of collecting. Memoirists invariably refer to his ascetic lifestyle and interest in Eastern philosophy and religion and attribute a stripped down Zen quality to his fixation on tea drinking and even the methodical leisurely composition of his, of his notes. Um, yet Kuzminsky writes about being struck by Bogdanov's organization of the random, quote, his faultless method of aesthetic selection, end quote. Uh, Kirill Kozirev and Boris Astanin, who were the editors of the notes, have pointed out Bogdanov's development of an aesthetics of the list, which has the curious capacity to bring together and somehow systematize literally earth-shaking events of worldwide significance along with the contents of Bogdanov's kitchen table. As Bogdanov himself writes, quote, let it be said about me that I am an artist of tea and its accessories, vividly describing the solace of tea rituals and ceremonies in this anxious age, loving only objects related to tea, albeit indirectly like alcohol and fruit, books, 
and things to smoke and adding in my head icons to this list. And now putting something else here into my still life, something that harmonizes nicely with the tea implements, fire or bread, or at the last clouds illuminated by the non-evening light out the window, trying to impart to all of these things a simple, though perhaps sly, solid construction of a well-composed still life. And in real life, always trying to perceive the beauty of the manifest interrelations of things, equating the laws of beauty to all encompassing concepts with an endless number of meanings, end quote. I think you can see very much here that, that we are also dealing with someone who is a visual artist. What is this completeness, asks Benjamin in his essay, The Collector. Quote, it is a grand attempt to overcome the wholly irrational character of the object's mere presence at hand through its integration into a new expressly devised historical system, the collection. And for the true collector, every single thing in this system becomes an encyclopedia of all knowledge of the epoch, the landscape, the industry, and the owner from which it comes, end quote. Bogdanov's notes can be read as a quintessential example of collecting raised to the level of utopian project, the creation of a self-sufficient world with its own events, values, and even economy. As Kozirev and Astanin ask, might we say, quote, that Bogdanov somehow saw the subtle order of cataclysms and sought the key to it, end quote. In more recent scholarship, Alexei Konakov has even suggested that Bogdanov's project should be understood as an authentic scientific investigation, that his accumulation of data was part of an entirely non-metaphorical search for a key to understanding a vast global network of natural disasters. In any case, Bogdanov's collecting can be seen as simultaneously a strange kind of culmination and a reversal of the literary collecting we saw in the 1920s. He obsessively compiles lists in a search for order, but the content of these lists is profoundly rooted in the world of the Soviet 1970s and 80s that surrounds him, its meager everyday objects and patently untrustworthy newspaper reports. Bogdanov, like Fuchs, can be seen as cataloging the deliberately unesthetic trifles of his time, moreover, in an extremely objective way. He identifies things, subjecting everything to intense attention, in a way utterly devoid of psychology and emotion. This might be a bracing corrective to the idea of artistic practice as the expression of individual genius and inspiration. Yet the skeptical psychological distance between the individual and his or her time, which was such a driving force for Ginsburg and Wagenhoff, seems to have disappeared for Bogdanov. As Sergei Sokolovsky points out, in Bogdanov's semantic and stylistic universe, ideology heavy newspapers, quote, found themselves on par with medieval Far Eastern prose, Georgian tea, and cheap cigarettes as sources not only of information, but of the fabric of speech, end quote. Despite his own shutaway version of internal immigration, Bogdanov is fully present in his time and place and believes that a possibly utopian subtle order might actually emerge from his investigations if they can go on long enough. So here it is a, a tragic detail indeed that the final entry in the notes is, is dated about a week before his death. Um, so to conclude, um, the way I see it, Kuzminski and Nikrasov are these very typical children of the thaw in their obsession with truth telling, straight talk and this bracing expose, Rezablachenia. Um, despite their overt criticism of the historical moment and their cultural environment and their fixation on commemoration, they both show this utopian orientation um, in their collecting activities. Along with Bogdanov, their efforts can be seen as oriented toward posterity, toward the future, toward us, uh, who are presumably the people who will sort it all out later on. Um, but despite this noble motivation, all three of these writers inevitably get caught up, if not immobilized, in the process of collecting, such that their results are not necessarily so easy to parse, let alone use. Collecting and creating alike in the conditions of unofficial Soviet era literature exacerbated the problem of sprawl. The ethics of Kuzminsky's project points to the difficulties of closing one's collection to new material, 
when the publication conditions were so patently unjust. And in a situation of highly limited readership, Nikrasov's lexicon collection would be hard pressed not to turn into the kind of self-referential feedback loop that he describes. Um, so he writes, quote, I was very opposed to finishing it by a mere act of will. The lexicon itself, as became clear over the course of its operation, wanted too much. Everything at once. To be an objective text. If not, then why is it just then why is it a lexicon? And a personal poetic text. It's not really a lexicon after all. But just picking a random place to end to end it seemed unconvincing and somehow dishonest. And meanwhile, the rows themselves, if you let them go on their own, and that was the whole point, didn't end. They just kept expanding. The potential lexicon kept expanding and refining itself, but the real work was losing its shape. And with time, it fell back and shelved itself. At End quote. We have seen how Kuzminski too was unable to find a logical stopping point for his collecting and Bogdanov's notes end only with his death. Benjamin famously claimed that the collector is motivated by quote, dangerous though domesticated passions end quote. Though the objects he collects may be mundane, the drive to accumulate and systematize can be overwhelming. Obsessive long-term collecting provided the impetus for both commemorative gestures and striking innovations on the part of these late Soviet writers. Reading them today, we are ourselves bound to systematize the detritus scattered yet again by the centrifugal force of time. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ainsley. That was amazing. Um, why don't we open the floor for questions? Um, everybody, you can raise your hand, uh, but since there are a lot of people, um, it might be more effective if you uh, posted your questions to the chat. Um, so yes, uh, please, please feel free anyone to ask a question. Um, yes, Timothy, go ahead. Uh, Tim, you're silent. Yeah, I, 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 am I unmuted, colleagues? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Ainsley. That, that was that was absolutely fascinating um, um, presentation. Um, I have many, many questions, um, uh, beginning with the possible influence of Ezra Pound's cantos on the culture of literary collecting in this period. I haven't considered the cantos in many, many years, but it has this this same kind of feel. But um, let me just bracket that and, and um, very briefly suggest that, that a term that perhaps you will find useful in, in developing your analysis yeah. is, um, is hoarding. I was waiting for that word hoarding <laughs> to come up as potentially uh, uh, an opposite model. That is, could you, could you distinguish along semiotic grounds, along semiotic lines uh, between collecting with literary communicative cultural purpose and hoarding as uh, some, as perhaps something more like a symptom of of uh, unhealthy, fetishizing um, obsession with the self, and um, and in connection with, with with Kuzminski, I was thinking about um, uh, Dostoevsky's experience in the Omsk prison camp when he too collected a notebook full of uh, supposedly random statements, which, which reflected the, the special lexicon and, and worldview and emotions of the prison camp experience. I will stop, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, about the cantos, I will definitely have to look into it. I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar enough to, to see the connection right away. Thank you, I will. For hoarding versus collecting, I think it's a good it's a good idea. I think I think that collecting kind of has hoarding inside of it already. Like I would I would I would perceive that not as two options or poles, and more as just a continuum. And if you get too far in one direction, then you're then you're just hoarding. Because I think that what I am um, in the case of 
at the very least, what I described in Nikrasov and Kuzminsky, I don't think that either of them ever fully loses sight of the idea of the community and the idea of this as, as, a, as something of a public activity. Um, whereas I think that what you're suggesting about hoarding is something that absolutely loses sight of anybody ever seeing what you're what you're hoarding right it's it's a it's a very private thing um but it's an interesting i mean you're you're right that i probably should have used that word and i think it does characterize some of the more extreme ends that this gets into um i also think that the idea of hoarding is very interesting in relation to a, a related topic that I'm actually looking into right now, which is the idea of unofficial archives. So this is uh, this is certainly, I mean, what Kuzminski has. And also, if there are researchers in the audience who want to work with this material, Amherst College's um, Center for Russian Culture has Kuzminski's archive, which is one of the biggest personal archives I have ever seen or worked with. It's like more than 80 boxes and it's not even the whole thing yet. Um, and uh, however, the archives that I've worked with in Russia um, in my research on unofficial, on unofficial literature are almost all in private hands. They're in people's apartments. Um, and people are variously generous or ungenerous about allowing access, um, what kind of access they want people to have. And I think that in that area, you get into something that looks a whole lot like, like hoarding in a very straightforward way. Um, and for the Dostoevsky thing, I, I, I think that's a great, that's a great uh, predecessor, certainly for, for what Vaginov is doing, right? Certainly, certainly an influence um, on this idea. I mean, it's, it's really cool because there is this um, early Soviet focus on like narod, right? And, and, and privileging of something that, that would have once pejoratively been called prastarichia. Um, but at the same time, there's this huge gulf between the intelligentsia figure like Vaginov or Dostoevsky for that matter, collecting this kind of homemade exotica. Of, of the language that, that the more common people use. I think that when you get to, to Nikrasov and what he's doing, it's quite different, right? Because the language is different. Um, Nikrasov is a very, for all of his, uh, for all of his anger toward the Soviet like Stroy, he's a very Soviet guy. He's, he's not an elitist. In, in in a lot of ways, so so that that becomes different, I think. But thank you; these are really good comments, and and give me give me wonderful things to respond to. Uh, okay, next up is Evgeny. Uh, let me ask you to unmute. I think I have to I have to unmute. Yeah. There we okay. go. Okay, can you hear, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um. Hi, and 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 thanks for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have. Uh, I think a, sort of an, an objection and, and a question. So my first point would be um, about what you call the sprawl. And if you would um, care to point what was uniquely Soviet in, in these collections that you discussed sprawling uh, out of the intended scope, because in my opinion, that is the, the very nature of, you know, extensive uh, collecting that, that it takes up a life of itself. and that ultimately there is uh, nothing um, essentially Soviet in that. Also, um, a small question: If you um, would you do, do you think you could distinguish between more conceptually between the early Soviet and the late Soviet period in what you've looked at? If how would you draw a line if if there is a line? And, and finally, the, the the question would be: Would you um, in any way relate this literary activity to the popular and uh, really far-reaching practice of collecting that was the pastime of millions of, of uh, late Soviet um, everyday people, be that stamps, uh, pins, uh, or what have you. And that was, in fact, something that was, um, in a way, uh, popularized from the top as a means of 
getting rid of the excessive amounts of cash in 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 the Soviet economy. And if uh, if do you think if the, the, there is a connection between the elite literary practice and the mass every day? Thank you. Thank you. These are great questions. Um, <clears throat> as for uh, to answer the first one. Uh, which is what is particularly Soviet about about this kind of sprawl um, that I describe. Um, so I, I really argue, and I think that it is, I think I can make this argument. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't, I don't think I would say that it is particularly Soviet. I think that it is actually something that we see in these, in this unofficial community, um, and by which I mean specifically people who are either barred from publishing or who have decided, and you see more of this in the later 70s, who have decided not to try, right? Who have decided that um, there is no way to make a career uh, through official channels. Um, and I think that what you see then is a kind of an accumulation that has a lot to do with the absence of literary institutions, right? The, the, the idea of creating um, in, a, in a situation where you don't really have a lot of editing, you don't have the kind of channels uh, that, that triage writing. And so you have, you have people who are producing and producing and producing. And I mean, you do see the uh, a very interesting development of unofficial literary institutions. When you get later into the 1970s, you start to see Samizdat literary journals that do have a kind of a editorial process. But having, uh, I can say, having worked on a lot of these writers from this period, you go and you look and they just have everything. They just saved everything. And there is this sense, like what I quoted from Kuzminski, there's this sense that we just have to hang on to it because things are going to change at some point. And then my brilliant work will see the light of day. And, uh, and it's, I don't know, there's something very... Um, to me, charmingly relatable about that. I mean, I have a hard time throwing out scraps of paper, right? Uh, but I think that that if you if you imagine people who are in a situation where they've made the conscious decision not to try to work within the officially available frameworks, but they also don't have other um, outside frameworks that are telling them, you know what, that's crap. You have to you have to move on. You have to write something else. And, and I think that that's the sprawl I have in mind. I also mentioned only briefly uh, some of the work of the Moscow conceptualists, but I think that if I was going to expand this into trying to, to really um, uh, uh, develop the, the collecting metaphor and the sprawl metaphor, then people like Dmitry Prigov or Lev Rubinstein, they take sprawl as like, uh, um, material to work with, right? I mean, Brigov fetishizes this. He says, I, I literally don't throw anything out. He has his grobiki of un unsuccessful poems that he crumples up and then staples into little packages and hands out to friends. So this is, this is the kind of thing I have in mind when I talk about sprawl. And I think you can point to some of the specific conditions of literary production in this unofficial um, context that, that, that justify it. Um, so for early and late Soviet, um, I think that what I, well, so the, the, the criteria that I outlined in, in my talk that I see as different, I think that late Soviet, you get a little bit more self-consciousness about, about the, um, <clears throat> the fact that you're collecting things that, that might be objectively of very little value. Um, I think that, that that comes more to the fore. I also think that um, there is, I think that the stagnation metaphor that is often applied to the late Soviet period is maybe useful um, in that I think in the early Soviet period, there is such a sense of rapid change that there is some of what drives collecting is the idea that I have to I have to fix this particular moment because it's going to change next week or something like that. Whereas in the later Soviet period, um, it, it, I don't know, it, it's, it, it leads more into sprawl, right? Because nothing is changing and nothing is stopping me. 
it's almost like having endless space in the cloud or something, right? Like, why not just keep it all? Um, so I think that, that that's not a very, I don't have a very coherent and, and, and neat answer to your question about early versus late, but those are parts of my answer. Um, and as for the question about the, the widespread collecting of Mielichi, in in Soviet society, this is a great this is a great point. I would like to work more with this point. I don't know if it's that important of a connection, um, because I don't know enough about uh, stamp or metal or whatever collecting in late Soviet society to say how much it was different from like people who collected stamps in America during the same time. Um, I don't know if there was a, a sense on the part of someone like Kuzminsky or Nikrasov that what they were doing was collecting of that type, right? Um, but it is an interesting, it is, it, especially if you could show that it was incredibly common uh, to collect stuff. Um, the only difference I would like to explore there is obviously when you collect stamps or government issued coins, um, the parameters of collecting are set from outside. Um, and I think that the collecting that I am pointing out in early, both early and later Soviet periods um, is at least by the authors perceived as something more idiosyncratic, like, like that it's important that they have decided what they're going to collect and that it is a strange kind of framework of their own invention. So thank you again. These are great questions. Good food for thought. Um, okay, next question comes from Lena. Uh, I'm going to read it out loud because um, I think that's more convenient. Uh, I'm sorry I came in late, uh, blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Uh, so this, this uh, audience member is wondering how you got into this topic of research, Ainsley. Why the choice for this type of alternative poetry or literature? Um, how are these underground Russian figures important for research in the American context? Uh, do you see them influencing American writers? And for example, what is Kuzminsky's legacy in the US? Great, oh, okay. Um, so I started researching unofficial, uh, unofficial Soviet literature actually because I was getting into contemporary Russian poetry. This is a while ago, this is like, God knows how, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and I uh, I kept on hearing from contemporary Russian poets how some of the most important figures for them were figures from unofficial Soviet era poetry. Um, and other, I mean, uh, before I started hearing about it from these contemporary poets, I had never heard any of these names. I don't think that it would have been something I would have been exposed to as part of a standard Russian literature education in this country. Um, so that's how I, that's how I got into it. And then it, it was a total um, whirlpool effect. I was sucked in permanently. Um, how, so why, I mean, I, the whirlpool is why I am still working on it, I guess. Um, but I, I have found that for especially research into the literature and culture of the 20th century, um, a lot of these figures are really crucial figures for understanding everything that went on. Um, how much are they important for research in the American context? I think my answer to that probably actually will come from my practice as a literary translator. Um, so I do a lot of translating and I have translated uh, work by a bunch of these writers, uh, I guess of the figures I was just talking about, Sevalid Nikrasov, I, I did the book, I co-translated a book of his work and I've translated quite a few other um, writers from this period. And so in that sense, I guess I can hope that they may go on to influence American writers. As far as any kind of direct cross-Atlantic influence in the time, there is not so much, I would say. I mean, the the only really obvious figure is, is Joseph Brodsky. So Brodsky emigrated to the US shortly before Kuzminsky did. In fact, poor Kuzminsky um, really thought that uh, 
Brodsky had paved the way and that he was going to be received with the same kind of enthusiasm as Brodsky and hopefully also eventually given a Nobel Prize. And um, he, he, he was very resentful subsequently that nobody loved him as much as they loved Brodsky. Um, but, and I don't know, I think it's probably an open question for um, American poets, American writers, whether, whether Brodsky who did become a prominent English language figure, whether he influenced or continues to influence writing. Um, and Kuzminski's legacy in the US I think is minimal. Um, the Blue Lagoon anthology was published amazingly in all of its nine volumes, but it did not exactly get popularized in a big way. It's, it's also probably hard to sell on people because it's nine volumes and they're hardcover. Um, you can get them, you can look at them in most university libraries. Um, he did very much he did very much think about, uh, he wanted very much for this poetry that consumed his entire life to be a huge splash in the United States. That was definitely what he was going for. Um, he at, at one time was planning a lot of like public events that would be popularizing this work. And uh, that kind of dried up for him. I, I don't know if uh, I, I kind of expect that Reagan becoming president has something to do with that, right? I mean, this anthology is, is, is coming out in the first years of the Reagan presidency. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, I mean, again, speaking from my experience as a translator of um, somewhat obscure authors from Russian, um, I think that uh, it's, it's sometimes a hard sell and uh, Kuzminski was not that good at uh, Afarmlenia, so. Uh, so uh, a follow-up comment uh, mm -hmm. from Timothy. There may be another conceptual and methodological parallel between poetic literary collecting or collectionism and the curating of museum collections. I mean, I think that uh, I think that in the case of Kuzminski, he is uh, even though he's like this uh, rebel enfant terrible figure, he's still a kind of classic child of Leningrad, which is the museum city. And I think that his practice, even though again he's favoring these um, marginal or anti-canonical figures, he definitely has in mind the kind of preservation for the ages approach that you see with, with museum curation, by all means. Um, so I actually have a question um, that I'm going to like horn in and ask, uh, <laughs> which uh, like builds upon something that I think Evgenia was talking about. Um, I was interested in hearing more about the utopian dimension of the collecting. Like I'm really fascinated by mm -hmm. the idea of uh, I don't know, like creating your own um, internal underground universe with its own set of values and its own uh, definitions uh, mm -hmm. and ideas about what constitutes an event. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that as it, that aspect as it connects to the utopianism of the 1920s avant-garde. Uh, because it, I mean, it really, and of course, like the, some of this is like probably deliberate, but it really reminds me of the, the practices of the Chinaidi um, and their creation of like a like a basically an autonomous parallel universe, which had its own conception of utopianism. Uh, Great, yes, yes. I, I kept on saying the word utopia just because I think that it is. Um, I think that it's definitely part of what's going on. And I also um, I have these. I've been having these uh, wonderful periodic conversations with. Um, a friend in Moscow, Igor Gulin, who's an interesting literary critic who has been thinking about what utopia means in the late Soviet period, because um, there's, this, there's this idea that the late Soviet period is all about stagnation, it's all about the loss of hope, the end of the idea that there is still a bright communist future ahead. Um, and so what place is there for utopia in, in that kind of a space. Um, I think that 
for at least like I don't want to make too gigantic a statement about all the collecting of all the unofficial writers in the late Soviet period. But I think that for Nikrasov, for Kuzminsky, um, maybe not as much for Bogdanov, but I think for the, the, the latter two, um, I think that their, their sense of utopia is remarkably similar to the sense of utopia that we see in the 1920s. I think that it's, I think that it's really long modernism still. Um, and I think that they, I think that there is direct influence on their thinking from those 1920s thinkers, including, I mean, uh, Harms was very important for Nikrasov. And I, I, I mean, I know that Kuzminsky um, includes him certainly in his personal canon, along with the other Abriu writers. Um, Kuzminsky is a bit more, in terms of his personal tastes, uh, he's very, very much influenced by and drawn to the early avant-garde, but more of the like throw Pushkin off the ship of modernity kind of avant-garde, um, not so much the deeper philosophical um, thinking of, of the Abriu. Um, and so I actually think that their utopia is really backward looking in that way, right? It's, um, it's sort of like picking, like, like Nikrasov says, picking up the pieces that are left and seeing what you can do with them. Um, and so much of this forward thinking utopia has to do with bringing along this huge baggage of the, of the, um, early pre-revolutionary and early Soviet culture that, that is seen as lost. So it, in some ways, it's almost like they don't have, it's almost like the utopia idea for, for those guys in particular does not actually evolve very much, does not reflect huge differences, even though it's 50 years later. Um, that's how I see a lot of what I read in, in Kuzminsky and Nikrasov. I think that what's going on in Bogdanov is, is more complicated. I, I don't feel like I fully understand it, but I do think that there is a strange sort of, I want to use like this Vidensky slash Prigov Mirzania term um, to describe this, this later kind of utopian vision um, that is a utopia. It's like a utopia after utopia kind of thing um for the uh for the for the later i think 70s and 80s uh early early 80s for the stagnation period and um i think that's something i have to think more about but yeah the the basic answer is that i think that uh the, it's it's a conservative and retrospective project to a large extent for for a lot of these guys yeah yeah i find that i find that super fascinating because like of course, the intention was not to be conservative. Like there's there's a there's a combination of uh, um, like stylistic risk taking and and obviously like political and like lifestyle risk taking. So it's really interesting, you know, combined with this um, this conservative or like looking back aspect. I think that's that's super super interesting. Um, so I have a question from or possibly a comment. I don't know yet because I haven't read through it from Anya Eisman. <laughs> so I'm going to read that out loud. Uh -huh. uh, Kuzminski's collecting seems to me personally incredibly hegemonic. And given his status as a conduit for English language audiences, the collector's potential for acquiring cultural capital certainly seems to have panned out well. I do wonder whether these practices were not hege hegemonic in the case of women collectors, who I imagine were perceived differently, less as authorities, less objective, maybe even more materialistic or domestic. Though expanding the possibility of accumulating to extend to words, not just objects is also a materialistic practice. Maybe there's a question in there. Anya, are you able to um, uh, emerge? Yeah, let me let me find <laughs> let me find Anya in the. I am like lost in the like. I can. I mean, I can. I can. Oh, yeah. Here? Hi, I'm here. Yeah. Sorry, I hey, can't um, turn on my camera. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I guess this is kind of a question about this. Um, you know, basically the collector's practice reconstituting, whether you think it reconstitutes the underground, 
to be more to have more you know uh, i guess um opportunities for hegemonic structuring so that you have this like you know collector hegemon on top of all these other smaller you know yes well, sorry i'm here preparing for my class tonight so like smaller lesser masculinities yeah uh, uh and uh uh you know who all fit into the nine volumes of, <laughs> you know who's mean oh yeah no i mean i can so yes absolutely i mean of course there's all these there's all these ironies that even are related to what maya was just talking about with this idea of utopia that is not um that is backward looking and of course uh, Kuzminski sets himself up definitely as as a hegemonic figure, but then at the same time, you know, is extremely limited in his scope, actually, even more like he emigrates and immigration provides him with this opportunity um, to be this this master of his domain and, and make it public, but then at the same time marginalizes him ultimately, like in a very serious way. Um, uh, I mean, to the extent that if he had stayed in Leningrad, um, he probably would have had a lot more agency and authority in the relevant scene than he ends up having having left. Um, so, uh, as for the as for the gender thing, so um, you will not be surprised to hear that there are far fewer collections of this sort made by women at all. Um, one very funny uh, uh, related anecdote from, from the Kuzminski annals is that among the many collections he, he produces, because he keeps on making sub collections and, and side collections um, all through these years, he makes this absolutely reprehensible collection called Zachem Yaeta's um, uh, which is of like really bad lines of poetry written by women which is like supposed to be as insulting as it sounds and in general like his his attitude toward women is is i'm i'm writing an article about it um so it is worthy it is worthy of discussion and i think that that gets into your um question about hegemony and what i know you're thinking about for your class about masculinities in this context um because it's definitely he seems to find it very important to uh, climb to the top of his small insignificant pile of stuff over the heads of women. Um, so uh, not, not a very original, original approach, but it's definitely there. <clears throat> um, Matve has a question, but Joan uh, Neuberger has also been- Yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, so it looks like Joan is next and then Matve. Joan may have overlapped with Kuzminski, no, at Austin? No, I mean, oh. yeah, uh, no, I didn't overlap with him. Oh, okay. But I mean, talking about his legacy, it's probably biggest here <laughs> anywhere, right? Uh, at least people still talk about him. Um, anyway, thank you for this fantastic talk. It's incredibly suggestive and helpful for me. Coming from cinema and especially from Eisenstein, who was himself an amazing collector, um, mm -hmm. uh, a different kind of collector, but still a collector. So um, I'm wondering, it makes collecting seem to me like um, like a dynamic process of montage, and I'm wondering if any of your if any of your writers talk about collecting and sort of presenting their collections in terms of a kind of dynamic montage process. Especially maybe Bogdanov, it seems like might be. I don't know. That's my question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the short answer is that I, I haven't encountered that word in particular, but a more extended answer would, would contradict that because uh, to begin with, if you actually look at the layout of Kuzminski's anthology, um, it is very self-consciously uh, reproducing a lot of the visual language of, of the avant-garde, including a ton of montage. And the anthology includes a lot of visual material and a lot of photographs um as well as and and even the way the text is presented there's a lot of mixing up of fonts and things pasted around each other mm -hmm. so i i think that that i mean i've thought about that in relation to Ilya kukulin's book which posits montage as the primary device of unofficial of unofficial literature and so i think that that's i when i look at that as when i look at a lot of some that materials this is a very familiar um use of, of, of uh, the visual. Um, uh, 
I also think that uh, what I was describing of Nikrasov's poetic practice is another really good example of montage because um, the image that I used for the, I'll just quickly show you again, the image that I used for the first page of this presentation, um, mm -hmm. this thing on the left, this is like a lot of how he was working. Um, so he has these these word lists, right? That that can be cut up and mixed together. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he's very interested in like what happens when you have an unexpected combination, right? So when you when you when you have like maybe a sort of a somewhat logically determined uh, progression of words, phrases, combinations, and then what happens if you take this part out and put it elsewhere, right? Um, so those are the two areas that, that I would, um, I would immediately point to in, in Bogdanov, there's, there is this actually very interesting narrative flow that brings together these very disparate items in a way that, that sort of disguises the montage, like it's, it's the opposite effect. So even though, even though he puts well, I don't know if it's the opposite effect because I am definitely not a, a film scholar, but um, maybe it's really effective montage um, in that um, things that you don't, I mean, yeah, I guess in the, in the Eisenstein lexicon, um, mm -hmm. like that's good propaganda, right? Where you don't, you don't notice that disparate things are being put right next to each other. Um, but, but unlike what I associate with like early uh, Soviet film montage, like there's no choppy, um, it's not drawing attention to itself very often in Bogdanov. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Mate, do you want to ask your own question or can you, can you do you want me here? Let, let, let me attempt mm -hmm. to unmute you. Thank you. Uh, it's very simple. Um, I was just curious about, um, uh, sorry, I can't figure out how to, you have to, uh, I can see, I can see Matvey, but um, what is, I don't know about Shimyakin's Museum of the Imagination. Well, just because Shimyakin and, um, and uh, Kuzminski had worked together before, mm -hmm. it might be curious to think about uh, Shimyakin's own collecting in the, in the Museum of Imagination, which is, what well, was in Hudson, New York. I don't know where it is now. Oh, okay. But uh, the idea of a kind of, um, museum of images grabbed from all, all kinds of places of books, et cetera, that, um, uh, you know, is connected to a surrealist tradition of collecting. Um, it could be of, of use, uh, perhaps. Um, I mean, and that's also, of course, like the Max Ernst um, book uh, collage montage <laughs> tradition, those books that Max Ernst did that collect Victorian illustration, mostly uh, Victorian era kind of um, illustration and re refashions those kinds of kind of um, non-art um, uh, images into uh, new sort of un, um, un you know, narratively confusing um, books. Uh, so I don't know, I, I'm just curious because the, the Shemakian thing is also a very sort of a maybe perhaps a, a different way of thinking about this, the utopian side of um, uh, your project. Um, and I, I do think that there's a, there was an echo um, of, of Harms's truth, um, Harms's collection of nonsense or mm -hmm. nonsense and what Maya was suggesting, but also in the sense that, um, you know, when Harms talks about the, uh, uh, about the gift in particular and kind of objects and decorations, I think that there's some keys there to, to think about what, what is this useless object um, that is uh, propelled like for someone like Bagdana uh, into a space of um, great, greater meaning. Um, that's just one one thought, and then I was also curious about the kind how you're going to disconnect uh, literary anthologizing and editing from, uh, or how are you going to clarify that 
type of distinction because the Blue Lagoon is a is a is a cynic, is a collection of aesthetic objects from a particular you know that are meant to be um, anthologized <laughs> poems, and uh, that's how they live and how they since since like the classic Greek and Latin anthologies, right? So um, uh, I'm curious how you're going to separate that type of work from the work of collecting non-aesthetic objects, or perhaps you know make make clear the conceptual framework that allows you to consider because Kuzminski is anthologizing as collecting. Although, I mean, obviously, I, I think you have lots of ways to do that um, through the archive and so forth, but I, I do think that's sort of like an interesting um, pivot and perhaps a pivot to think about the Nikonova or someone like that who's also anthologizing and editing um, and putting together aesthetic objects in, in non-official um, uh, culture. I'm glad you brought up Rinikonova because um, I think she makes a really, actually, and this is part of an answer maybe to Anya's question, um, because I think it's really interesting to think about the difference uh, between her work and what Kuz someone like Kuzminski is doing. I think that Rinikonova is much more of a traditional um, avant-garde artist in that sense. I think that she is really collecting, um, I mean, she's collecting texts, she's collecting objects, but I feel like her her aim is primarily aesthetic. And with Kuzminski, and I'm, I'm glad you also uh, referred us back to Harms, I feel like uh, his, his collection, it's not only uh, the difference between collecting words um, uh, or objects and, and collecting texts and anthologizing, right? It's also that he's collecting like a, it's about, it's, it's, it's a community building kind of thing, right? And that's, and that's interesting, again, if you look back to the, to the Abriu guys um, and something like, you can look at the text of Rosgavore and say that here is this, the, the, it's like the, this collection of, of words and ideas that the, the the function of which is to is to create this community or to or to document and and bring into bring into some kind of more permanent being uh, these fleeting encounters right and I think that I think that that what Kuzminski is doing on this incredibly grand scale is that in in the anthology whereas I think when Nikonova is collecting stuff I mean she is geographically isolated right I mean she is she is somewhat in a vacuum um and it's it's there there is this uh community that is built through her voluminous correspondence with other writers um which is certainly significant um but I don't think it's the same kind of commemorative impulse um or even, or even the same kind of documenting impulse that you that you see with with Kuzminski, and then with looking back to the to the uh, uh, Chinari to Lipovsky circle, um, yeah. But this is very. I mean, these are good distinctions that you are drawing. It's it's definitely worth worth thinking in terms of the. I mean, I'm I'm very upfront about the difference between what uh, Nikrasov is doing with words and what uh, Kuzminski is doing, like as a as a compiler, but I do think that there is an interesting um, connection to be drawn there. I think that the I think that the the hoarding impulse um, is important and related to get back to what Evgeny was asking about. It's related to the conditions uh, of production. Okay, uh, so I think that this is all the time we have today. Um, I want to thank Ainsley so much for her talk and for everyone um, who came and who asked questions and participated in the discussion. Um, it's always wonderful to see that even on Zoom, you could sort of, uh, you could recreate the atmosphere of an, um, an in-person interaction to some extent through people's questions. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ainsley. Um, thank and thank you, you so Sasha. Much. forward to seeing you all in some kind of personal way <laughs> sometime in the next year. Here's hoping. <laughs>